Welcome to the One God Report podcast. It's just me today, Bill, Steph, and Preston are off doing other things, but don't worry, they'll be back for this podcast. We're going to take a quick look at the Gospel of John. Ever since I came to understand from the Bible that God, or his personal name in the scriptures is yud he vav Yehovah, or Yahweh, that he is one, and that Jesus is God's human Messiah, whom God raised from the dead, people would say to me, well, what about John 1.1? 1, 1? For my friends who believe in the deity of Christ, John 1.1 1, 1 is biblical evidence that Jesus is God. Now, I think they're missing a main point of what John 1.1 1, 1 and the entire Gospel of John are saying, and we'll get to that main point a little bit later on. But when people give me a verse in the Gospel of John, and for biblical Unitarians, this may be helpful in how to approach talking about the Gospel of John. And if uh, you're a Trinitarian, and maybe you're going to talk to me about the Gospel of John sometime in the, in the future, then uh, you'll be able to understand a little bit more where I'm coming from. And uh, you, you should be able to deal with what I'm going to say here. And that is, first of all, let's take the big picture of the Gospel of John. Let's take a, a little wider view of the Gospel of John. Not just one phrase or one sentence here. Let's start by looking at the reason that the author wrote the book. The author himself tells us the purpose that he wrote his book, or at least why he recorded the signs that Jesus did. In John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31, he says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are recorded so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So here the author himself has told us the reason that he has recorded the signs that Jesus did, and that includes the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Okay, he says this just after this climatic resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And he tells us the reason he recorded these signs. He doesn't say, I'm recording these signs so that you might believe that Jesus is God. He does not say that. Rather, the author himself says, I am recording these signs so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, let's imagine for a minute that William Shakespeare told us in writing the meaning or the purpose for the writing of one of his plays. Let's say The Merchant of Venice. Okay, that's a Shakespeare play. And Shakespeare didn't want any misinterpretation of his play, so he wrote right in the script, after a climactic act toward the end, a short description as to why he wrote. So we have on record the author himself, Shakespeare, telling us why he wrote the book, or why he wrote this play, The Merchant of Venice. But then, someone else, let's call him Conrad. Okay, if your name's Conrad, no offense attended, I just took a name from midair. Conrad comes along, let's say, 100 years later. Shakespeare himself is long dead. Conrad reads Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice in a different country maybe even in a translation, right, a different language. And taking a sentence here or a phrase there, Conrad ignores Shakespeare's stated purpose for writing The Merchant of Venice, and Conrad declares a new or a different reason as to why Shakespeare wrote The Merchant of Venice. But Conrad's interpretation of Merchant of Venice is not only different than Shakespeare's, Conrad's interpretation actually contradicts Shakespeare's own stated purpose. Now, whom should we believe as to the meaning and purpose for the writing of Merchant of Venice? Should we believe Shakespeare, the author himself, or Conrad? Who do you think knows the real reason for the writing of the Merchant of Venice, Shakespeare or Conrad? You see the meaning of my little parable. If someone comes along and picks a portion of a verse here or a verse there from
from the Gospel of John and says, See, Jesus is God. I must ask them, whom should I believe? Should I believe you? Reading in a different land and usually in a different language hundreds of years later, picking your verse here and your verse there, or should I believe the very author of the book? You tell me, whom should I believe? You say the book tells me that Jesus is God, but the author of the book himself tells me that he wrote to show us that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, you can understand why I prefer to believe the author and not you. I think the author knows better why he wrote the book better than you do. I might even say, do you believe the author? Do you think you know better than John the reason why he wrote the book? Now, really, about the only response a person could have to my question, right, whom should I believe, you or the author of the book? But the only response is to maybe say, well, well, the Son of God, that means to be God. Well, I'm sorry to say, if that's what you believe, you're wrong. Son of God in the Bible does not mean God the Son. There's no such person as God the Son in the Bible. The Son of God is never, ever God in the Bible. Now, you'll have to do a little bit of Bible study on this. If you're going to say that the Son of God means God, your interpretation of that biblical idiom is more in line with the Greek philosophical interpretation of what it means to be a Son of God. In the Bible, this term or title, Son of God, is a metaphor which describes the relationship that creatures have with God, especially human beings. It doesn't have anything to do with metaphysics. It doesn't mean you're the same essence as God is, as the later Greek philosophers interpreted the term. No, from the Hebraic biblical perspective, to be a son of God means you have a special relationship with God. The term is applied to Israel, for instance. Yahweh, yud heh vav -Hey, he calls Israel his firstborn son. It doesn't mean that Israel is God in some form of essence or nature. No, it's describing the relationship that Israel has with God in things like intimacy and inheritance and obedience and instruction. Now, especially the king who is descended from David is the son of God in the scripture. As you can see in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, God says to David, his descendants, to David's descendants, God says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. Or in Psalm 2, chapter 7, Yahweh, God, says, You are my son. Today I have begotten you, or today I have given you birth. Which brings up another very important way in which the title, Son of God, applies. See, even the Messiah, as we see in Psalm chapter 2, is born of God. God is the originator of the Messiah's life. And like with Israel, Israel is the firstborn son of God because they have existence, they have life originated by God. And even so, believers can be called the children of God. Going to John chapter 1, verse 12, to all who received him, that is the Messiah, and believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's the idea of being a son of God. Your origination, your origin, your life is from God. This is the reason the people of Israel could call God Father, because they knew that God originated them, because they knew that God gave them life. This is the reason that the Messiah would call God Father. This is the reason that Jesus, the Messiah, would call God Father. Not to distinguish one person of the Godhead from another or something like that. Jesus called God my Father because he knew that his life was from God. His origin was from God. This is why he could say to Mary Magdalene after his resurrection from the dead, as recorded 
in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and verse 17. He said, I am going to ascend to my Father and my God. He knows that God is his Father because God gave him life. Psalm 89, 26, this descendant of David, he will cry to God. He will say, you are my Father, right? You are my Father, metaphorically. You are my God and the rock of my salvation. So go ahead, look up the phrase Son of God and see if it ever means God the Son in the Scriptures. It does not. In the New Testament, go to the book of John. We have John the Baptist. He comes to testify, and he says in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 34, I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God, speaking of Jesus. Now, do you think John the Baptist was thinking that Jesus is God in the flesh, God the Son? Or maybe did John the Baptist have a different understanding of what the Son of God means than the Greek philosophical church fathers? Nathaniel, in the same chapter, John chapter 1, verse 49, the very first day that Nathaniel saw Jesus, he says of Jesus, Rabbi, which means teacher, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You see, for the Jewish people, to be the Son of God almost is synonymous to be the King of Israel, this designated king who will rule. And there's reasons why those two titles usually go hand in hand with each other. They're very similar. The Son of God is the Messiah who's going to inherit the earth from God. Martha, just before Jesus came up to raise Lazarus from the dead, she said to Jesus, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. She's not declaring that Jesus is God the Son. She knows that Son of God is the title given to the designated, chosen King of Israel. So again, whom should I believe? Should I believe you? If you're coming to me with a verse here and a verse there from the Gospel of John, look at, we know these. John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1, 1.14, the Word became or the Word was flesh. John 5.18, Jesus called God his Father, making himself equal with God. John 8.58, before Abraham was born, I am. John 10.30, the Father and I are one. John 20.28, 20, Thomas' statement, my Lord and my God. You're going to come with a verse here and a verse there and say that, see, Jesus is God. Look, the author told me he wrote the signs that he did, not so that I believe Jesus is God, but so that I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. So I would ask you to consider the possibility that you don't know the meaning of these handful of verses that you think are evidence in the Gospel of John that Jesus is God. Because the author himself, John, told us he recorded the signs that Jesus did so that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Not so that you would believe that Jesus is God. You know, it's a little bit like that Princess Bride movie. If I can uh, show my generational cultural influences here. You remember the, uh, the Sicilian guy? I don't know their names. The Sicilian guy kept saying, inconceivable, inconceivable. And then at one point, the, the Spaniard says, you know, I don't think you know the meaning of that word. Well, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm saying that I don't think you know the meaning of the handful of phrases and sentences in the Gospel of John that you're interpreting to say that Jesus is God. And when you do that, you're contradicting the author's stated purpose for writing. Let's now move to a second point as we view the bigger picture of the Gospel of John, and that is... There is no trinity in the Gospel of John. God, the word God, the title God in the Gospel of John, is never the trinity. Now, if you're a Trinitarian, you should at least acknowledge this, that there's no trinity described in John 1.1 1, 1, or anywhere else in John's Gospel. Look, try substituting the word trinity for God in the Gospel of John, right? This is supposed to be the Gospel that tells us that Jesus is God and that God is a trinity. Let's take the word God, the title God, it's hatheos in Greek, it's a definite article. 
and substitute the word Trinity. John 1.1. 1, 1. Does this make sense to you? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the Trinity, and the Word was the Trinity. What? Hold on a second. That doesn't make sense. So here the very first time that the word or the title God occurs in the Gospel of John, which is supposed to be the Gospel that tells us that God is a Trinity, the very first time that the word God appears in the Gospel, God is not a Trinity. Now, that's for the rest of the times as well that the word God or the title God occurs in the Gospel of John. It is not a Trinity. Go ahead, check it out. Find the word God, the title God, and see if Trinity fits. How about John 3.16? For the Trinity so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Does that make sense? You might even have to say, For the Trinity so loved the world that it gave its only begotten Son. Because the Trinity isn't really a person. The Trinity is supposed to be three persons. Or maybe you could say, the Trinity so loved the world that they gave their only begotten Son. Hmm, something's wrong here. The word or the title God is never a Trinity. Go on, see a few more examples. How about John 1, 6? There was a man sent from the Trinity. His name was John. That's John the Baptist. And how about what John the Baptist says? Come back to that. John chapter 1, verse 29. Behold, the Lamb of the Trinity. Come on. You know and I know that doesn't make sense. How about John 1, 34? John the Baptist, he declares, This is the Son of the Trinity. No, this is the Son of God. In the Gospel of John, God is never the Trinity. How about John 10, 36, where Jesus says, I am the Son of the Trinity. Oh, wait a second. He didn't say that. He said, I am the Son of God. So, over and over again in the Gospel of John, God is never a trinity. Now, the third point, the bigger picture of looking at the Gospel of John, right? We want, before we go and look at one individual verse here and there, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is the Messiah, not God. Unfortunately, in much of today's Gentile world, people have come to associate the title Christ, which is the Greek word for Messiah, with deity. But in the Bible, the Messiah, or Christ, is never God himself. In the Bible, the Messiah, or Christ, is a human person, most prominently a king or a priest, who is chosen and anointed by God. The word Messiah, or Christ, means anointed. You can see over and over again in the scriptures that the Messiah is differentiated from God. God is not the Messiah, and the Messiah is not God. So the question, is Jesus the Messiah? This is the central theme, or a central theme, of the Gospel of John. Trinitarians either don't know this, or they just ignore it. They seem to think the central theme of John's Gospel is, is Jesus God. But John's Gospel tells us that Jesus is the Messiah, starting in the very first chapter. In a comparison with Moses, John 1.17, the Gospel writer says, The Torah, or the law, came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus, the Messiah. That's John 1.17. Jesus is parallel to Moses, not God. Both Moses and Jesus the Messiah were human channels through whom God worked. Also in the first chapter of John's Gospel, people wondered if perhaps John the Baptist was the Messiah. And John the Baptist made it clear, I'm not the Messiah. Then, still within John's first chapter, John 1.41, we are presented with the declaration of Andrew to his brother Peter. We found the Messiah! Now we can imagine the excitement that must have been in Andrew's voice. His people have been waiting for hundreds of years for God to send the Messiah. And Andrew believed that the time and the person had arrived. Now it's also interesting to note that the author of the Gospel felt it necessary to translate the meaning of the word Messiah for his non-Jewish readers. 
which means Christ, he says. Andrew says, we found the Messiah. And the author of the gospel has to add in, which means Christ. Now, this is the question in the gospel of John. Is Jesus the Messiah? The question is never, is Jesus God? Look at the Samaritan woman, John chapter 4. She says, can this man be the Messiah? Come see this man who's told me everything that's ever happened to me. Can he be the Messiah? In the Festival of Tabernacles, John chapter 7, this is only six months before Jesus will be crucified. When he is going to go up to Jerusalem for the festival, the people asked, can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Messiah? That's John chapter 7, verse 26. And others said in John chapter 7, 41, after listening to Jesus, this is the Messiah. They're never saying this is God. It's not a question if he's God or not. Now in John chapter 9, after healing a blind man, the Judeans, that's the Jewish leadership, had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Messiah, he was to be put out of the synagogue. You see, there's no question at all if Jesus was God dressed up in human flesh or something like that. The question is, is he the Messiah? And if you confess that he's the Messiah, you'd be put out of the synagogue. John chapter 10 at Hanukkah, only a few months before Jesus is crucified. People come up to him in Jerusalem and say, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. They're not asking him, hey, if you're God in the flesh, can't you tell us plainly? No, it's never the question. The question is, are you the Messiah? Now, less than one day before Jesus' death, in John chapter 17, verse 3, less than one day before Jesus' death, Jesus prayed to God, and he calls God the Father. John 17, 1, he appeals to God. He says, Father, and then John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus, the Messiah, whom you have sent. Now, Jesus is not calling himself a second God person or something like that. He's not saying, God, this is eternal life, that you, they may know you, the only true God, and the second God person, Jesus, whom you have sent. No, it's that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus, the Messiah, whom you've sent. And finally, like we've referred to already, the author of the Gospel of John tells us the reason. He recorded the miracles or signs that Jesus did when he said, These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. If you're saying from the Gospel of John, these things are written, that you might believe that Jesus is God, you're changing the words of the author. You're adding to his words. That's a tragedy that later Roman and Byzantine period Christians interpreted the Jesus of the Gospel of John to be God. When Gospel of John, in fact, is declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, a fourth point of bigger picture of the Gospel of John. If you're going to come and say, this verse shows that Jesus is God. That phrase shows that Jesus is God. I'm reading the Gospel of John, and I think you're ignoring most of the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, Jesus calls himself a man as distinguished from God. John chapter 8, and Jesus said, If you were Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which he heard from God. This Abraham did not do. So in this very book, Jesus himself distinguishes himself from God. He calls himself a man. And once again, this is God. This is not the Trinity. He didn't hear the truth from the Trinity. He heard it from God. He is a man who heard the truth from God. These are the words of Jesus. And another aspect that you're ignoring of the Gospel of John relates to that verse I already referred to in John 17. Jesus prayed the night before he was crucified, saying, Father, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, 
and Jesus the Messiah whom you have sent. Jesus distinguishes himself from God. He calls the Father the only true God, and he calls himself Jesus the Messiah. He is not God. He knows he's not God. He knows he has a God. He calls the Father the only true God. So once again, if you're going to come to me with the book of John and tell me that this book says that Jesus is God, John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus himself says, no, there's only one true God, the Father, and that he, Jesus, is the Messiah. So to summarize, if you're going to come with a verse in the Gospel of John, like John 1.1 1, 1, or John 1.14 or John 10.30, and say that this is showing that Jesus is God, I think you are ignoring the bigger picture in the Gospel of John. First, you're ignoring the very purpose statement of the author himself. He declares the reason why he recorded the signs that Jesus did. He said, so that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, you're coming to me and telling me that the book is written so that we might believe that Jesus is God. Who should I believe, you or the author? I prefer to believe the author. Secondly, as we look at the bigger picture of the Gospel of John, there is no trinity in the Gospel of John. God, the word or title for God, God, Hatheos, in the Gospel of John, is never a trinity. This is very strange. If you're going to claim that the Gospel of John is the main book in the New Testament that describes or shows that God is a trinity, and yet the title God never means a trinity, something is wrong. Maybe you're interpreting the book wrong. The third point from the bigger picture in the Gospel of John is that in this Gospel, the question is is Jesus the Messiah? The question is never asked, is this God? Yes, the question is, comes to the front, is he the Son of God? But this is really a synonymous title for the Messiah with its own nuances. But again, the question from the Gospel of John itself, is this the Messiah? And the answer to that question is yes, Jesus is the Messiah. And the fourth point if you're going to interpret John 1.1 1, 1 as a deity of Christ, you better be able to explain John 17, verse 3, where Jesus himself says that the only true God is the Father, and that he, Jesus, is the Messiah. Now, we haven't even gotten to John 1.1. 1, 1. Well, we did, because we see that the Trinity doesn't fit in. We'll have to save it for another podcast. But let's just say this. John 1.1 1, 1 starts out, In the beginning was the Word. Now let's ask, what did John mean by the phrase, the beginning? Which beginning is this? Is that beginning the creation as described in the book of Genesis? Could it be that John is describing another beginning, perhaps parallel to the creation of Genesis? How does the Gospel of John use the phrase, the beginning in other places? How does 1 John, the epistles of John, use the phrase, the beginning? How about the book of Revelation? Why does the book of Revelation call Jesus the beginning of God's creation? So, the question is, is which beginning is the Gospel of John talking about? 